I will now talk about recurrences and their use for modeling and for counting problems. And we will do this through a, se a series of examples. And I just remind you that uh, uh, a recurrence is a formula of the form A sub n, for example, equal to A sub n minus 1 plus 3 A sub n minus 2, and so on. So it is a way of writing the elements or the items of a sequence for the nth element in terms of the elements in the n minus 1 position and n minus 2 position and so on. So this is a formula that we call a recurrence. It does not have an explicit form. So it is not a sub n equal 2 to the n or anything like that. And this, is, this style of writing formulas is very helpful for reasoning about counting problems as well as about designing algorithms. So let's look at the very first example here, which is maybe one of the most famous recurrences, which is Fibonacci series. So where did Fibonacci series come from? Actually, Fibonacci himself was looking at a counting problem of the following form, where he considered a, a pair of rabbits that are born at the beginning of the year, one male, one female, and this rabbit pairs you know, grow and, and reproduce over the months with the following rule that every rabbit pair, when they are born, of course, they are not fertile in the first month. Then in the second month, they become fertile, after which they can give birth. No, no uh, rabbits die during this time. And the question is, what is the number of rabbits at the end of the year? Okay, And we can look at it visually like this. So if I look at, at every row here in this table is the number of, uh, of uh, pairs of rabbits. So if I, for example, use an open circle for newly born uh, rabbits and a solid circle for fertile uh, rabbits. So here at the beginning, we have a pair of rabbits that is newly born. This pair of rabbits becomes fertile in the, sec in the second month. So in the third month, since this, this pair of rabbits became fertile, in the, in the third month, they have given birth to a new pair of rabbits. And this same, the same pair that was fertile in the second month still survives into the third month. Again, uh, these uh, rabbits don't die in this year. So this is, this is what was fertile in the, in the second month. The same thing happens now that this, this, rep, this reproducing uh, or fertile uh, pair of uh, rabbits, now they survive to the, second, to the next month as well here. They also give birth to a new, they give birth to a new pair of rabbits. And this pair of rabbits here that was, that was born in the third month, now they became, become fertile in the fourth month, right? And we repeat the same exercise here that this pair of rabbits here is fertile here. And the, the pair of rabbits, this pair of rabbits that was fertile in the fourth month is now here in this column. And this pair becomes fertile. And now this one, I will point to them by, with blue, this one here and this one here, now they give birth to these two pairs of rabbits, okay? So if you look at it like this, and now we are asking what is the number of rabbits in every month? So imagine that I call, you know, all rabbits of n. So all of n is the number of rabbits at the end of each month, at the end of month n, at the end of month n, okay? So, what is this number here? What, how can I reason about it? Of course, this I can look at it in terms of the fertile ones and the, the fertile ones and the newly born ones. So if I say, so all of n, it's basically the number of fertile ones at, in, time, at, in month n plus the newly born ones in month n. But what is the number of fertile ones in, in time n? It's all the rabbits all the rabbits that were alive in, in month n minus one are fertile in, in month n. So for example, if you look at this, at this row here, and you look at the solid circles, and so if you look at, at, at the solid circles here, there are two of them. These two come from the two pairs that were 
were alive the month before that. So f of n is all of n minus 1. So every pair that was alive in month n minus 1 is fertile in month n. What about newly born n? Newly born n is basically the number of fertile pairs in month n minus 1 because every fertile pair in, in, min in month n minus 1 gave birth to a new pair. But we have just shown a, a formula for f of n. f of n is all of n minus 1. So f of n minus 1 is all of n minus 2, right? So if we look at it like this, and I say all of n is f of n plus nb of n, well, f of n is all of n minus 1, nb of n is all of n minus 2, and this is where we get all of n equals all of n minus 1 plus all of n minus 2, which is Fibonacci's series. So this is how we reason about this problem recursively. And of course, we have to say what are our initial conditions. And here we know that all of 0, if we want to count from month 0, is 1, and all of 1 is 2. Okay, And there is nothing wrong with saying all of 1 is, sorry, this is 1 here. Well, there's nothing wrong with saying all of 1 is 1 and all of 2 is 1. In other words, counting from 1 to n rather than from 0 to n. Okay, so but be careful about the initial conditions. So this is this is a recurrence as a, this a re, this is a recurrence here where the number of rabbits in month n is the number of rabbits in month n minus one plus the number of rabbits in n minus two. Okay, let's see a different example here. A very fa another famous example for recursion and recurrences. It's known as the Tower of Hanoi problem. So in the Tower of Hanoi problem. What we have is that we have these three rods or three pegs here, peg one, peg two, peg three. We have a set of n uh, disks. These disks vary in their sizes. So we have the, disc, the largest disk all the way to the smallest disk. They are put on peg one and they are put in a specific order where the largest is at the bottom all the way to the smallest at the top. And our goal is to move all of these, all of them, sorry, all of them from peg one to peg two here. So we want to move them such that we maintain the order that the largest is at the bottom, then the second largest after that, and so on, like this. Okay, so we want to move them to the second peg. We have two conditions on how we can move them. One is we have to move the disks one by one. We cannot just take them all in one stack and move them to the second peg. The second condition, which is makes what, what makes the problem harder, is that at no point, at no point, should we have a situation where on any of the pegs we have a larger disk on top of a smaller one. So for example, you should never have something like this. For example, on the on the peg. Okay, this is not allowed. So we want to move the disks one one at a time, and then the disk, a larger disk can never be on top of a smaller disk. And the question that we want to reason about is what is the number of moves that we need? to move all these disks from peg one to peg two, while of course making use of peg three, such that we move them one at a time, at no point we allow a larger disk on top of a smaller one. So this is where again recurrence comes into the picture and is very helpful to reason about this rather than starting to count explicitly what is this number and looking at examples of two disks, three disks, and so on. This is where recurs recursion comes to the, to the rescue here. So if I want to think about this recursively, how do I move all these, how do I move all these n disks to, to peg two? Well, to think about it recursively is that I can take these n minus one, n minus one disks at the top here, and I th say, let's move all these n minus one disks to peg three. Once we have so this is our first stage here. We want to move all these, uh, the, all them, all of them to to peg three. I am not saying copy the top disk to peg three or to the second one to peg three and so on because that will violate the second condition where we are putting larger disks on top of small ones. I am saying that recursively, recursively, think about it. My problem now has become moving the top n minus one disks to peg three in such a way that I'm moving them one at a time 
and at no point I put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk, and I can make use of PEG2, okay? So this is the first phase. I wanna recursively move the top N minus one disks to, to PEG3. Once I'm done with that, then what I have is that PEG2 is empty, PEG1 has the largest disk, so in the second phase, I move this largest disk to PEG2. Once I'm done with that, now we have N minus uh, one disks on PEG3. PEG1 is empty. PEG2 has the largest disk, the largest disk here. So in the third phase, in the third phase, I wanna now move what, what we, so we now have these here. I wanna move them now on top of the largest and on top of the largest disk that is already on peg two, okay? So this is how we think about it, about it uh, recursively. So if I write it again, phase one, basically what we have is that I leave the larger disk on peg one, this is one, and peg two is empty, and peg three, we have all except for the largest disk, disk is or on big three like this. So this is phase one. Okay. After phase two, we have the same situation, but now we have moved, we have moved the largest disk to peg two, and peg three now has the other ones in the right order here. Right. So this is phase two, and phase three. Now phase three. Now we move all the, the disks from peg three on to, to peg two. So now one doesn't have anything. Two, now we started with the largest disk at the bottom and then we move the other ones here and so on. And then three doesn't have anything on it. And we are done, right? Because we have now moved all the, all the disks to peg two in the right order. So when we go from, remember that I denote by H sub N as the number of moves needed to move all of the disks from peg one to peg two. So the, num the total number of moves needed for me to accomplish the task. Well, what, I, what did I accomplish in phase one? What I accomplished in phase, in phase one is that I did exactly the same thing, but for N minus one disk. So to go from, to go from this phase zero, if this is phase zero here, to go from phase zero to phase one, I needed to move to do exactly the same exercise, but only on n minus one disks. So if h sub n is the number of moves to move n disks, well, h sub n minus one is the number of moves to move n minus one disks. Going from phase one to phase two, all I did was just move the largest disk from peg one to peg two. So this is one move here, okay? And here it's h n minus one. Moving from or going from phase two to phase three, I move the n minus one disks from peg three to peg two, and this is again h n minus one. Okay, so what we have now is that h sub n equals h sub n minus one plus one plus h n h sub n minus one. So we have two h sub n minus one plus one. This is the number of moves we need to move these n uh, disks from peg one to peg two, such that again, we move them one at a time and at no point we allow a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. So this is how we use this recur uh, recursively or use recurrences and recursive thinking to come up with a nice formula for the number of moves. Now, this, this uh, formula is this formula is not, is not explicit, of course, and the question is that what is this? What's the growth of this formula here? So I will clear some, some space here, and we will reason about it, okay? And I will show you one of the simplest ways of evaluating some recurrences. So what we got here is that h sub n is two h sub n minus one plus one. So what I will do now is what we call the substitution method, okay? The substitution method. What it means here is that when we look at h sub n minus one, substitute there the value of h sub n minus one using the same recurrence. So this is two, h sub n minus one using the recurrence is two h sub n minus two plus one plus one, right? 
So if we think about this, what is this? Is this 2 to the second h sub n minus 2 plus 2 plus 1. Okay. Now we substitute for h sub n minus 2, 2 h sub n minus 3 plus 1. So this equals now 2 squared times 2 h sub n minus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1. If we look at this here now, this becomes 2 to the third h, n, h sub n minus 3 plus we have now the 2 squared plus 2 plus 1. And now you see, you start seeing a pattern here. If I look at it now without even plugging in here, that what I will see is 2 to the fourth h sub n minus 4 plus 2 to the third plus 2 to the second plus 2 to the first plus, again, remember that the one is 2 to the 0. And we keep doing this. At some point, I will get all the way down to h1, 2 to the n minus 1 h1 plus 2 to the n minus 2 plus 2 to the n minus 3 all the way to 2 to the 0. Now h1, what is h1? It is the problem where you have just one disk on peg 1 and we ask you to move it to peg 2. Well, it requires one move, right? Because there is only one disk, I need to move it from peg 1 to peg 2. It's one move. So this becomes 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n minus 2 plus all the way and this equals we have done this before it is 2 to the n minus 1 okay 2 to the n minus 1 so the number of moves needed to move all the disks from peg 1 to peg 2 is 2 to the n minus 1 but we reasoned about it recursively and we came up with this recurrence that allowed us to, to find the, the solution in a very elegant way, I would say. Okay. So again, keep in mind this method of evaluating a recurrence. For some simple recurrences, you can do the substitution method and a pattern will emerge that then you can summarize the result. Let's look at a very different problem now. And I want to count numbers of strings with certain property. So in this case, I want to count the number of bit strings of length n that do not have two consecutive zeros. Okay, so I will not allow something like this. Zero, zero is not allowed. One, zero, one, zero, zero, one is not allowed and so on. Okay, so I want to count the number of strings that do not have zeros in them. And the strings are of length n. Okay, they are zero, one strings of length n. So how do we reason about this? We need now to think about these strings of length n that do not have zeros. And let's focus on the very last symbol in them or very last uh, digit in them. So if you look at them here, if you look at the, the number of bit strings, and if you focus on the last one, it's either the last one is that this is one, and we have n minus one symbols here, or they are of length n, and they end with zero, right? So we have the set of str bit strings of length n are the set of bit strings of length n that end with one, and the length of the set of um, bit strings of length n that end with zero. There's nothing else. So now I can basically take the union of these two, and I got the right set. Now, if you think about it, what are the what are the the what is the number of bit strings of length n that do not have two consecutive zeros and end with one? If it is if it ends with one, then we need the bit string of length n minus one to not have any two consecutive zeros. So, if this number here, if a sub n is the number of bit strings of length n that do not that do not have two consecutive zeros then all the strings that end with 1, we don't want any of the n minus 1 uh, substrings to have two consecutive zeros. But this is a sub n minus 1. Because a sub n minus 1 is the set of all strings that do not have consecutive zeros in them. You can append 1 to them at the end, then you get all the bit strings of length n that do not have two consecutive zeros and end with one. Notice that adding appending one at the end is not a problem because 
the uh, position n minus 1, we could have 0 or 1. A pending 1 will never create two consecutive zeros. If the previous string did not, if a string of length n minus 1 did not have uh, two consecutive zeros, a pending 1 at the right will not create two, uh, two uh, consecutive zeros. Now, if we look at the, the other set, the set of strings of length n that end with 0 and do not have two consecutive zeros, since they don't have two consecutive zeros, then we know for sure that the n minus 1 digit here has to be 1. If it was 0, then they will have two consecutive zeros, right? So it has to be 1. So now we have 0, 1. These strings have to end with, zero, with 1, 0 here. So now we ask, what about, what is this number of strings? We use the same recursive thinking. We say this, this, the number of strings that, of length n that end with 1, 0, it's exactly the number of strings of length n minus 2 that do not have two consecutive zeros. So this will be n minus 2. So really the, the recurrence for this is that it is a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2. Okay, so this would be the recurrence. What about the initial conditions? So we need to look at a sub 1. How many strings of length 1 are there, bit strings of length 1, that do not have two consecutive zeros? Well, all, st all bit strings of length 1 do not have two consecutive zeros, and there are two of them. What about a sub 2? What about wh How many bit strings of length 2 are there that do not have two consecutive zeros? Well, it is 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. There are three of them. Okay. So this is the recurrence. a sub n equals sub a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2, and these are the initial conditions. a sub 1 equals 2, a sub 2 equals 3. Okay. Let's look at a s different problem, but on strings as well. And suppose now we want to say that we want to find the recurrence, recurrence relation here, sorry, recurrence relation, and initial conditions for number of bit strings of length n that do not have three consecutive zeros. Okay. If they don't have three consecutive zeros, again, let's look at the very last, the very last uh, symbols in this in this uh, string. Okay, so this is all the strings of length n. If they end, they can end with zero. Here, in which case, you know, we have the same the same issue as before. If the a sub n is the number of strings of length n that do not have three consecutive uh, ones in them, well, ending with zero here means that appending 0 to a string of length n minus 1 will never create three consecutive ones, right? Because we are appending a 0. So whatever was the number of strings on n minus 1 that do not have uh, three consecutive ones will give us the same thing here. So this will be a sub n minus 1. So if there was a sub n minus 1 bit strings of length n minus 1 that do not have three consecutive ones in them, append a 0 at the right, you will get bit strings of length n that for sure do not have uh, three consecutive ones. Another way we have is this ends with one. Now, ends with one, there, is, there are two cases here because we are talking about three consecutive ones. Either this was one and the one before it is zero, in which case here, we need to look at the number of strings of length n minus 2 that do not, have, uh, do not have three consecutive ones, and this is a sub n minus 2. Another case here would be that it ends with 1, and it, it has another one before it, but for sure the one before that has to be 0, otherwise we have three consecutive uh, ones, right? So now we have the last three digits are 0, 1, 1. In this case, we have here a sub n minus 3. So to recap, this one here gives me the number of strings of length n minus 1 that do not have any three consecutive ones in them. I append 0 to them at the right and I'm done. These ones here are the number of strings of length n minus 2 that do not have any three consecutive ones in them. I append 0, 1 to them and I'm done. This one here is the number of string bit strings of length n minus 3 that do not have three consecutive ones in them, I can append 0, 1, 1 to them, and I'm done, right? So from this, we get a sub n equal a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 plus a sub n 
minus 3. Okay. What about the initial conditions? If I look at a sub 1, how many bit strings are there of length 1 do not have 3 consecutive ones? Both strings of length 1 do not have 3 consecutive ones. If you look at a sub 2, if you, all 4 strings of length 2 don't have 3 consecutive ones. If I look at a3, there are 8 strings of length 3. One of them has 3 consecutive ones, which is 1, 1, 1. The other 7 do not have that. Therefore, a sub 3 is 7. So this is the recurrence, and these are the initial conditions. Okay, So this is how you think about this. Let me show one more example about, it's a different example, different type of problem here. And in this case, I want to look at count the partitions, number of partitions with, with, the, with the recurrence. Okay, As a reminder, a partition is when you have a set and you partition it into k set, subsets. None of them is empty and no two of them have anything in common, okay? So when I give you a set like this of size n, and I say partition it into k subsets, you partition it like this, one, two, three, four, and so on to set k, with the, the union from i equal one to k of these a i's should give us a, and for every i and j that are different, a sub i intersection with a sub j is empty. This is what a partition is, okay? So now here I'm looking at a problem, a very interesting problem that says, how many partitions are there, okay? And of size k, okay? So how many ways I can partition a set of n elements into a set, into a set of k sets, none of which is empty, and no two of them have anything in common. Okay, so let me clear this and let's think about it recursively. So I'm looking at S of n k here. Okay, and let's look at the not the the base case here or the initial condition, but let's look at it first at uh, at the the elements themselves. So suppose the elements. Let's look at the recurrence for the general case. Suppose the elements are one, two, all the way to n. Okay, see this this is the set A that we want to partition into k subsets. And let me look at this element n. So we have two cases. We have two cases. There are all partitions, all partitions into k sets such that we have n is by itself, okay? So all partitions into k sets where this is one of the sets, it is a set that has n by itself. And then what does this mean? This means that the other n minus one elements have to be partitioned into k minus one sets, right? Or subsets. So when I look at all partitions of this set A into k subsets, some of the partitions are going to have the, 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 the element n as a set by itself. If that is the case for these ones, for these partitions that have n as a, sub, a set by itself, then we, but we have to have the remaining n minus 1 elements partitioned into k minus 1 su, su, uh, subsets. Another case, the other case is that n is not in a set by itself, n is actually with one of the k sets, okay? So the other case that n is an element of one of the k subsets, right? So here we have you know, these k subsets and n is one of them, n belongs to one of them. Well, how many ways can n belong to one of them? n can go into the first one, it can go into the second one, into the third one, or into the k one. Okay, so there are k ways this element n can belong to one of these k subsets. And what is the number of ways of part partitioning the remaining n minus one element into k subsets? So we have s of n, sorry, not n here, n minus one and k. 
So S of n minus 1 k, comma k, is the number of ways of partitioning n minus 1 elements, the elements from 1 to n minus 1 into k sets. And we multiply by k because we say take the element k that is not in any set now, and there are k ways to put it in any of these sets. The first one here with n is in, in uh, itself. This is like partitioning the remaining n minus 1 into k minus 1 subsets. Okay, So the, the recurrence for this form s of n sub k is n s of n minus 1 k minus 1 plus s of n minus 1 k times k here. Okay, So this is the recurrence. What about the boundary cases? If I have if I have n elements and I want to partition it into one set, there's only one way. Okay. And what about if I have n element and I want to partition it into n sets? There is one way as well because we don't distinguish among the sets. Okay. So these are the boundary conditions, and this one here is the the general form of the recurrence. Okay. Again, think about it recursively, the formula will make sense. Either n is a, is, a, is a set by itself, in which case we now need to recursively partition the remaining n minus 1 element into k minus 1 sets, or n is an element of one of the k subsets, in which case we say let's partition the n minus 1 elements into k subsets, that the s of n minus 1 comma k, and then we can put n in any of them. There are k ways of doing that. This is why we get the k times s of n minus 1 comma k.